Um, and the slides are there not so much to illustrate what I'm talking about, but to give you an idea of, in my work as a scientist, the kind of world that I inhabit, the imaginary world or, or the physical world that I inhabit, uh, which of course conditions uh, what touch means uh, for me. So um, I'll go to a set piece here. Uh, so I've been asked to contribute to our discussion from the perspective of a scientist rather than an artist or a musician. My original training is in physics uh, and in astronomy, but my main activity as a scientist has been the designer and builder of instruments, which of course is a very long tradition, not only in the sciences, uh, but in the arts. So I work in, within a scientific research laboratory with teams of scientists and engineers and technicians uh, building all kinds of devices that intermediate between me and, and the universe out there. In some cases, these are observatories that are launched into space around the Earth uh, to get above the Earth's atmosphere to be able to see things that we cannot see from the ground. Uh, in other cases, uh, we're building devices and robots that will be sent to land on other uh, bodies, planets uh, within our solar system um, and indeed, uh, one of the groups at the laboratory where I work right now is helping build a robot that will be sent in about 2001 to go land on a comet, uh, pick up a piece of the comet and analyze it and study it. And indeed, there are other projects that plan to bring back pieces of the comet, of the comet back to the Earth. Uh, and so indeed, uh, in a very practical sense, the kind of science that I do is not only one of observation, but also of reaching out and actually collecting things, touching things that are in the world that I study. <coughs> so if I can now go to the first slide, maybe you could just turn it on for me. Um, and let, if you can turn that light down. Um, <coughs> So these are the kinds of instruments uh, that I'm involved with. In this case, it's a radio telescope. And my first work as an astronomer, in fact, was using a radio telescope to observe the universe. Um, Mathematical theories 
and testing these against what we know about the world and can discover uh, about the world. The settler mentality accepts certain constraints. For instance, that the Earth is our home, our ecological niche. The human destiny is to be conceived of within the framework of this planet and to reach out to the stars, we build telescopes that allow, allow us to extend our senses to see further and with more detail things that we cannot see uh, unaided. We can also build satellites and robots into space as our physical representatives to visit other places, to the surface of the moon, the surface of Mars, or indeed to explore the surface of a comet. And even now there are teams of engineers and scientists we're designing the first robots that will be sent out to the nearest stars and will eventually uh, reach them in, in, long in the future uh, for our future generations to listen to the signals from. So for the settler, the planet is a place of finite resources and a finite duration. <laughs> Sending humans into space to colonize or migrate to other worlds is costly, unnecessary, and maybe even undesirable. And indeed, this kind of worldview is one that most of the astronomers that I know sort of share. Um, what they're really interested in doing is understanding the universe, and they view this almost as a spectator sport. Uh, and it's a very well-established, ingrained uh, set of assumptions that in fact motivates the kinds of ways, the kinds of tools, the kinds of devices uh, that, that you will build. Let me switch now uh, back to some other slides. So this is the view of Europe, leaving the Earth, looking back. You can see all the lights in France, England, and Holland is probably the brightest place uh, <laughs> on the map. Uh, so going out into space, uh, that's the home looking back. This is the uh, observatory uh, that we operate from the University of California, Berkeley, that's there studying uh, the sky. Uh, and even as we speak now, it's pointing at stars and sending the images uh, back to the ground. This is an artist's conception uh, of a sculpture in orbit around the Earth. It's not up there yet, but it's already uh, visualized. And uh, Arthur Woods, the artist in, in um, Switzerland, is, is trying to build it. And so indeed, the settler mentality can be contrasted with the mentality of the migrant. And so I want to co contrast this worldview in a caricatural form I think it, it does underlie the kinds of approaches that different people take to touch extraterrestrial world, worlds. For the migrant, the planet Earth is but a starting point, a birthplace, and our destiny lies in finding and overcoming the barriers to extraterrestrial migration. The instruments that I will build are not only extensions of my senses, but in, in fact necessary to modify my physical nature to allow me to survive in new or hostile environments. For the migrant, the building of a telescope and a robot is but the initial step, it's the foreplay before building space stations, habitats where humans eventually can move out and explore and evolve on a different uh, cultural track. And I want to argue that the touch of the settler and the touch of the migrant are of a dis different nature fundamentally. The touch of the one seeking to internalize the world around at a distance, the other seeking to externalize the world within. And even though these are sort of caricatural, I think they're useful ways of looking at the different ways that the settler and the migrant considers touching extraterrestrial worlds. So well, this is a painter's conception of an astronaut fighting in space. Actually, it's a painting painted by an astronaut after he came back to the ground. Um, artists have various conceptions of what extraterrestrial worlds uh, would look like. This is actually a kinetic painting by my father, Frank Molina, made in the 1950s in Paris. Indeed, space can be viewed as a very friendly place where you would take your dog and do your cooking. Uh, in this illustration from Jules Verne's book. Or it can be a cold place like Antarctica, uh, where there's not a, nothing to be seen except the horizon and, of course, the footprints that we've left behind. 
course, we take with us many cultural assumptions of what it is to touch in a foreign place. I have referred um, in my sort of scenario of the, of the center of instruments as extensions of the senses, and in many cases, this, in, this is the fact is an appropriate characterization. When as an astronomer, I build a telescope to study a visible object, and I know that if I then go touch the object that I see through my telescope, it will be there. Indeed, the story is told, and it's probably apocryphal, that Galileo Galilei, as he was beginning to use the first telescopes, would point them at the mountains and the hills across the valley, and then he would actually get his hiking boots on, I guess they weren't hiking boots then, and walk across the valley and go touch the rocks that he had seen with his telescopes to convince himself that his machine was not hallucinating. Then he could announce with confidence that when he turned the same telescope to the surface of the moon and saw mountains, that they were mountains. Uh, that he, through the act of touching, in fact, had been able to confirm, justify, substantiate what his perception told him. When I, as an astronomer, build a telescope that detects infrared light, for instance, I know if I go touch the objects that I see with my telescope, they will be hotter or colder, depending on how much infrared radiation they're putting out. Infrared radiation happens to be a very good measure of the heat content of an object. When I study the sky with an ultraviolet <coughs> telescope, I know that if I should go uh, out there and put my skin in front of that object, I would get more or less sunburn, depending on how bright things were in the ultraviolet. However, in a number of ways, and a number of people have written about this, it's profoundly misleading to think of telescopes and sighted instruments as extensions of my senses. My instruments are not all just preamble to touching, but some of them, in fact, are of a different kind of nature. So this is an artist's conception it's from the 1940s, I think, of a, um, a human settlement on the moon. Earth rise looking back from the moon. This is a more industrial vision of what we might do on the surface of the moon. It's a mining settlement envisioned by an artist in the 1950s. There are the tracks that uh, we've now left on the moon. No traffic jams there yet. So indeed, in the first place, many instruments provide me with extensions of my senses, but other instruments provide me with new senses that have no equivalent in my body. When I build a radio telescope like the first one that I showed, I see a universe around and I make images that are profoundly misleading of what my telescope sees because my body, in fact, is, is conceptually, physically incapable of detecting radio waves. So it is not a matter of amplification or in intensification. It's actually a matter of converting information from radio waves to something that my body can sense. And indeed, I bring with myself all my intuitions that have to do with the senses that I know about in interpreting those radio images. The same is true for telescopes that detect X-rays or gamma rays, other forms of light that the body is incapable uh, of detecting, or neutrinos that travel through matter, they travel straight through the Earth without stopping, and the telescopes to detect neutrinos don't look at all like the kinds of things that we put in front of our eyes, and there are now telescopes that detect gravity waves. All of these telescopes detect things which we are physically, conceptually incapable of detecting directly. And so when I use these devices, they are not extending my senses. They are really adding me new kinds of senses that provide me other information about the world around me. I can never even conceptually go touch the things that I see with those new kinds of telescopes, not because they're too far away or the objects are too big or too small, because they do not exist in a way that I can directly perceive with my own senses even amplified. And so the kind of perception that I have is of, a, is of a different nature, where in my everyday world, the world that I see or smell or taste, it is continuous the world with the world that I can touch. When I see something, I can go touch it. However, 
the world that I see with these new sensors, these new kind of telescopes, is discontinuous with my touch. There is no conceptual way that I can go take the image from a radio telescope and then go try and touch the thing that's emitting the radio waves, because in fact my body can never, never sense it in, a, in, in any direct kind of way. And so those kinds of objects or phenomena are conceptually non-touchable, even though I can perceive them and incorporate them into my view of the world. And so I think we have to think in a different way about how we can experience uh, touch for these kinds of situations. Of course, this last remark uh, actually intuits obviously another factor. I can extend my sight or give myself new kinds of sight, as I just described, but I cannot extend my hearing into space. Once I leave the Earth's atmosphere, there are no sound waves. Space is inherently silent until I get to another planetary surface with enough atmosphere on it that sound waves can travel again. And so there is no such thing as a sound telescope in astronomy. And indeed, sound is, is quantized, is fragmented in the universe around very localized places where there is an atmosphere that can carry that kind of a signal. When I'm standing on the moon, I can feel the vibration of the ground from your approaching, approaching footsteps. There is no way I can hear them, nor can I smell nor taste, except on planets which are very similar to my own. And so indeed, whereas sight is almost a universal sense, taste and smell and hearing are very special kinds of senses associated with our own particular kind of environment. And so if you like, touch and seeing are universal senses, but taste, hearing, and smell are local senses. By sending a robot to touch, just as the Martian robot touched the rock in the slides I have been showing, I am extending the kinds of senses which, which have continuity with my perception. But there is no way I can send proxy touching to places that I cannot perceive directly. So this is a view of the planet Mars as we're uh, coming into orbit around Mars with the polar cap on, on the top side. Maybe you can turn the lights out a little bit. This is the surface of Mars where you can see some of the, the features from the flow of water on the surface. You can see the sand that's been washed around the rocks. Some of those are wind patterns, some of them are uh, water uh, patterns. And so the so Sojourner robot landed on the planet on a parachute, and then it bounced, inflated, inflated these big balloons, and the, the robot is inside that cluster of balloons, and the, the robot bounced about five or six times before settling. The air then deflates from the balloons, revealing the little robot hidden inside that cocoon that is protected as it landed on the surface. And in fact, that surface is frighteningly similar to what your backyard might look like in some parts of California. <laughs> it is comprehensible, and indeed the cameras on this robot have been carefully tailored to mimic the human senses. It's no accident that it looks familiar because the cameras on that robot have been equipped with lenses that mimic uh, those of the eyes so that you back at home would feel at home uh, seeing the images. Here is the picture of uh, Sojourner uh, touching a rock, although I have to admit that particular picture was done back on Earth, not on the planet Mars, even though it might be quite hard to tell the difference. And hence the, the problem with tele-epistemology. How would you tell the difference uh, between a virtual world that is highly, very well simulated and one where in fact you sent a proxy? I have said uh, that as an astronomer, my sense of sight is not always continuous now with my sense of touch. I cannot necessarily experience the things that I perceive. There is another way that the astronomer view of the universe is disjoint. One of the projects that I'm working on is a project to study and understand the origin and evolution of galaxies. To, this, to do this, we built telescopes of a particular kind that look in the ultraviolet to look at the most distant and very faintest <coughs> galaxies in the universe. And one of the most amazing things to me is that indeed today, 
an astronomer with the devices that we have at hand can study the universe over the bulk of its history since the initial Big Bang that led to the phase of the current universe. But as you all know, the light that we see now has taken millions or billions of years to reach us. So that I am seeing these galaxies as they were, not as they are now. If I, even if I were to try and go there, the galaxies that I am studying would not be as I see them now, and indeed may no longer exist uh, as galaxies as such, because many galaxies collide, cannibalize each other, and get absorbed. And so when I got to that galaxy to try and explore it, I would be studying the galaxy as it would be in the future, not as, not as it was as I saw it when I left. So the objects may no longer exist, they're discontinuous with my perception, and so that conceptually, even if I went to touch them, they no longer exist in the way that I saw them at the time that I took the picture. And so whereas today the rough surface that I see is rough, rough to the touch and the smooth surface is smooth to the touch, this reassures me and allows me to venture out without fear into the world that I perceived before entering. On the other hand, the distant universe that I see with my telescope is more like the world seen by archaeologists than the world that I live in today. It's a world where I can be a spectator, but not a participant. So this is a view of the, of the surface of Mars where Sojourner landed. You can see the, the two mountains in the distance. And uh, as you all know, one of the things that the teams of scientists and engineers did is they, they put a name on every rock they could see in the picture. <coughs> and uh, I think Yogi Bear is the, is the little rock that's the right that the Sojourner is about to go visit. And so this is scenes coming down the ramp. There was probably a picnic basket waiting, or the photographer is just outside the frame, <laughs> <laughs> setting up the lighting. So the lighting was perfect. Um, you can sort of see how frighteningly familiar that, that landscape is. And as I said, it's no accident because the cameras on the device are made to mimic uh, human eyes. That's some kind of a prehistoric symbol on the surface of the rock is a hieroglyphic. We don't know how to read it yet. <laughs> Some of the ones we're talking about things one does to understand certain messages. I'd like that I'd, I'd like to go into a, a different comment now, which is one that, that is worth expanding on a fair amount, which is that my instruments are not just extensions of my senses in another way today because they are beginning to have minds of their own. My instruments are now highly computerized, and computers can be viewed as very advanced technologies of memory. The robot that I send to the other planet, or Mars, or the comet, the observatory that is orbiting the Earth today, it knows, and that's a <coughs> slippery world, word, many things that I do not know. The robot collects information about its environment, and it analyzes it, sorts it, interprets it, stores it, and then looks at the limitations of telemetry and radio and only sends some of that information back again. In many cases, I can then go decide to go back to that robot and probe its memory and find out what it knows that I don't know yet. But in any other case, many other cases, the robot itself will decide that, that information was not of interest and erase it from its own memory. Indeed, the new Martian robots that are being built now are being equipped with really what can, what can only be viewed as primitive intelligences. This robot itself, because the communication time between here and the surface of Mars in the, is in the tens of minutes, had to have enough autonomy so that when you told it to move, it would not suddenly roll down a hole that you hadn't seen because it was just behind a little rise. And so this robot had enough autonomy to keep itself from, from tumbling down a, a hidden hole. And indeed, if during uh, the communication period the robot had kept moving, I would never know that that hole was there on the surface of, this, of the planet, but the robot did. The robots that are being built now can make a number of internal decisions about what they're going to do next, depending on what's been happening. So, for instance, if you were studying the, the weather on Mars with one of these devices, you might decide that an average day is of no interest, 
and you would just erase that data from the, the computer memory. But as soon as the wind got a little bit higher or hotter, then it would record that memory and send it back to you. And there are different ways that a robot can define what is interesting and then send it back to Earth. Indeed, in some of the most sophisticated robots, this is an adaptive process where the software that you load into the robot modifies itself depending upon the environment that it finds itself in. So even though you may know what the software was at the point that you loaded it into the machine, 10 years later, you may have no idea what the, the computer memory of that machine now contains because the software has evolved internally into the machine. So even though it's tempting to think of a robot as the extension of my touch, as it is in this case, the robots that we're beginning to build uh, really need to be viewed in a different kind of way. I can no longer pretend that it's just an extension of my own locomotion, but it is a primitive being collaborating with me, exploring another world. The robots that we're beginning to send to Mars tomorrow are more like dogs going with us on a walk in the countryside. They indeed share the same world with us, and they can touch the same things, but they also see and hear things and smell parts of the world that we are blind to. And so that collaborative activity of working with these robots that are getting more and more sophisticated is one of collaborative touching, where indeed neither one of us will have the complete picture, but only the two of us together, or many of us together, will indeed be able to build a self-consistent view of what the world is like. So extraterrestrial touching is not only the reaching out of the migrant, but also the reaching in of the settler. My instruments and telescopes are not only devices of remote touching, but of remote being. I'm not just made more sensitive by these instruments and telescopes, but I am in the process transformed into a different uh, being with different desires and dreams and needs.
in the next, in some of the projects from Mars from now, they're talking about sending fleets of several hundred small robots to the surface of Mars. Each of one is really highly specialized. So there are smelling robots, I'm exaggerating, touching robots, listening robots, feeling robots. Each one of them has only one sense, for instance. So we're very used to the idea that the person comes with a package of senses, but there's nothing that, that, that makes that the most obvious way to build things. And so uh, the, this, this net of very tiny robots that they're thinking of sending on the surface of Mars is, a, is another direction, which is you, a being has one sense, not multiple senses. But there's some sort of resonance here, because in a sense, a musician is obsessed with a single sense. It's trying to channel all of the experience of being able to see it through his ears. On the other hand, you want to open yourself up to all these other experiences. We're interested in gestures. We're interested in cultural life. We're interested in relating to an audience. And all those things. But we're, there's always a dialectic. We're drawn to our obsessions, our artistic obsessions with a particular sense, or particular form of thinking. And suddenly realize that no one is talking to us anymore. And uh, <laughs> well, I think we're really good because we're all. Yeah, yeah. Although those ones we know. They're without obsession, Mark. I, I guess no, I know they're, they're always, there's always these, these lost musicians, the ones we never see because they never achieve that. Or so. <laughs> well, they run it down and it becomes a textbook you discover. I, I, I disagree with the way you, you're posing the problem because yeah. um, I, I think the senses is sort of an academic's view of, of existence uh -huh. because, and as we were talking about before, when you're listening to music, it is not a sound experience. It's mm -hmm. a combination of a number of things coupled in different ways. And somewhere in here, you're making a model of what you are hearing. It doesn't, I mean, it is not. I mean, there is no way that this apparatus is a single modal in any stage of uh, perception. Uh, and, and David was talking about some of the coupling between the visual and the sound apparatus and so on. And so, um, I, I don't think, I don't think the world is, I, mean, I don't think existence is that way, is that way. Um, and most painters that I know talk about the kinesthetic experience of painting just as the dancers do. Um, so and what I meant was in the sense of, in, in this synthetic aspect that we, as human beings, say, as synthetic instruments, are in, in the state you are respect to robots in the sense that we would use it in an almost for telerobotic way or something sometimes. And so we found, we haven't reached maybe a point that you have. But, and it's a true statement that computerized instruments have, have great trouble integrating multimodal information. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that, is, that, that is a level that very few robots are able to do. And so they tend to analyze things in linear channels and then combine scenarios, overlay them. Yeah. That would be a question I would just like to pose. Because I think the idea to make a kind of collective of robots, which has, where every robot has a specific site and site specialized, in getting information concerning the central um, apparatus. Uh, this is a very interesting approach, I think. But I'm asking myself, how are the, all these data collected together? Is there a kind of idea that there exists a kind of collective intelligence in this robot population? Or is the fact that only the robots are collecting data which are interpreted afterwards by human beings? Which is sort of interesting. That is a question which is in, in, the the case of, of, in case of that fleet of small robots on Mars, mm -hmm. uh, each small robot sends back its sensory data to a central point. And in fact, um, you throw away data only unless these two robots agree they've seen something. <laughs> As you know, it's really easy to fool a robot. <laughs> and so you, know, you need to build in certain kind of robustness to look against hallucinations. I mean, uh, <laughs> the telescopes we use hallucinate all the time. Uh, I mean, they, they generate signals inside the devices, which, if you naively just take what comes out, it has no direct correspondence to what went in. And so, um, it, it's um, I mean, it's a very real problem in a technical sense of how you how you would design such fleets of, of micro robots. Um, with a compound problem, but it's, there's so much information collected that you can't really send it all back to the Earth and then do the synthesis. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have to stage things, make some integration on the surface of the planet and the rest back here. What was the gain of sending uh, human beings to the moon? Well, but in fact, if, if you're within the settler mentality, it's, it, it, was, it was just plain dumb. 
And it, you know, it's a pointless thing to do because if you take the point of view that the human being arose out of this environmental niche and will never be able to live in space, then it, it, it's just the average. Right? But if you take the migrant point of view, it's inevitable. Right? And the, 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 this tension exists within the, 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 our society, uh, whether it's uh, settler to migrant uh, mentalities uh, in society at large or within the scientific community. And so there's no doubt that the, the migrants had the upper hand in the 1960s in the United States, and it was coupled to other reasons. Right? I mean, but if you just want to study the moon, it does not help to have human beings there. They just need crash. There wasn't anything gained, except politically. Well, it, it was maybe, yeah. it maybe is a little bit quicker, because at the time, the computers that we had 20, 30 years ago were not as sophisticated as now. But if you really want to study the moon today as the moon, the way to do that is to send different kinds of robots to probe the, the, the moon. But what about what was gained sort of in the collective mythology? I mean, going to the moon is going to be a huge advantage in that way. Everything. Maybe not in terms of the question of science, There's a book by White called the, the Overview Effect, which, which and basically it's irreversible once you've been there once. Right? Once you've been there once, uh, there is no way I mean, that the myths are forever affected by that. And so you know, I have to be a migrant. You know, I'm living, I'm an American, born in Paris, worked in California, and then living in Marseille. Right? I would like to go to the moon. <laughs> so the fact that someone did it once um, is very positive for the human mythology. Um, and, and not write mythology the same way now that we've actually been there. Um, so I, I agree with you. I mean, the psychological and mythological impact is, is tremendous. But also from the point of view of this conference, isn't there something gained from knowing what it's like for a human to walk on the moon and knowing what that gesture is like? I, and I, I guess that's part of what I was trying to explain. That's only if you accept that everything you can see you can touch. Right? But the universe is not like that, the world out there. I mean, there are many things out there there is no way we as human beings can detect, perceive, or directly apprehend. And so, you know, as we add new senses, there are parts of the universe you can never conceptually touch. So those radio images, I will never be able to walk there and touch them because they're not apprehendable by my, my senses. So, yes, you're right in the sense that the parts of the universe you want to visit are the ones we can see and touch. But there are parts of the universe which we cannot both see and touch. So I, I, I agree that within that framework that it was complicated. There was the question whether they had been really there. And somebody <laughs> figured they were there. Well, I mean, in fact, if you, if you go see Ken Goldberg's website, he now has five or ten small Gedanken art experiments uh, where, where your challenge is to figure out whether it's a real thing at the other end or a simulated thing. And in fact, it, it's in most of these cases, it's, it's impossible. You, you, there's no way to determine that. Now, in this case, uh, um, I guess there are there are ways that you could. I mean, the Russians knew, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> there are other ways of, of photographing those people on the moon other than, than CBS television. <laughs> well, you, said, you said something interesting about um, development. Beyond our grasp, because of its quantity and its complexity, 
um, has to be translated back into seen form um, in order for us to assimilate their streams. I think you were saying that um, there are perceptually or conceptually, I can't remember which term you use in this particular instance, non touching phenomena. And, and then when you look at something like uh, Warren Robbins, Neil you know, Manipulator, um, he's dealing with this non touching phenomena and he's interpreting them into a happy form that we can appreciate. Okay? Do, do you think that your migrants, as opposed to your settlers, um, are more open to accommodate uh, the ungraspable? Or the not, not the whole one, fact. I, I, or they're both just as handy. I, I think they're, they're both equally valuable views and equally successful, actually, in human history. But both strategies are viable, survival strategies. Um, but, but I think, and, and part of what I've been trying to develop in this essay is, and in fact, Wessel's talk was an example of this, I mean, the ability to conduct an experiment is really crucial, not only to the, to the little cats developing that conceptual system, but to the whole scientific method, right? I mean, the, the, this ability to close that control loop in some way uh, is, a tr is a huge bootstrap uh, in terms of comprehensibility, believability, or all those kinds of things. And so the fact that I can send that robot over and have it push a rock down a hill, right, would, would, would in terms of a, of a human understanding, it's a different uh, domain. And so um, I think it's maybe not so much the act of touching, but the, the act of being able to do something and see the world change the result. And, uh, and I think that, that you can do even with, with senses that are not senses of senses. In an earlier conversation, you said that in experimental situations, uh, the robot might not be good enough, that you would rather have human touch there. Did I understand that? Um, yeah. th th this is a, a huge debate. Um, the people who are building the space station that's going around the Earth and will house astronauts, they argue that we are hundreds of years away from a robot sophisticated enough to notice things that are really interesting to follow up. And so that human being who's in that space capsule doing things will notice things that are very, very subtle, a little bit wrong, and then follow those up. Nobody knows how to build uh, automated devices to do that. And so that, I mean, their argument is that the presence of humans in space is just necessary for pragmatic terms. I mean, there's no way you can build a sophisticated enough robot to, to notice unusual things. Well, I find it amusing you had this, this robot to kind of agree amongst themselves that uh, what they touch is real. And so you have this consensual reality amongst these robots as, as part of uh, mitigating what information is in fact. A lot of people have written about this problem, but I mean, what you're talking about is not very different from how a human community agrees on what things should be studied, can be studied, how they can be studied, right? So um, the fact that there are primitive robots in that equation doesn't change that problem. I mean, there is still a consensual situation with which you know, we as human beings are involved in um, that decide which, which things are worth doing, which things are not worth doing. So, I don't think the robots change that equation, um, as, I, as I understand it. Uh, I have a very basic question. Um, I'm looking at the infrared lights, and they talk about instruments where you can see how people see from the galaxy. And it would be very interesting to me, I've tried to get hold of it through the university of physics labs and really these kind of things, um, a way that I can get very glasses to see it,
assume you're in a dark space, otherwise you know, the, the visible light will, will block that. Thank you.
you shouldn't be able to predict what, the, what, what sense is relevant to the, the construction of the perception of the curve. I mean, it, it, any nucleus might be, might be a general. Well, I mean, it's, it's also like, I mean, it's a, it's a synesthetic thing because I mean, you, can, you can get visual distortion as a result of auditory input. I mean, um, Part of exactly what you're saying. I, um, there was this previous discussion here this afternoon about what, what, what in a think of automatic or automatic processes, things that you just yeah. yeah. And you know, there are many senses that never need to emerge into that aware place of the of the mind, right? And so many of our sensory things. Um, in fact, we'll, and I don't even get deep enough into that processing to actually be aware of some of the some, some of the very primitive um, primitives uh, th that are happening. And so, indeed, there may be ways of perceiving things uh, without being in a direct sensory uh, kind of way. Um, I mean, detecting waves around islands, right? I mean, they, 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 I'm sure they did not sit down and plot the wave pattern on the drawing and then. See where it focused on. Oh, well, they, they do what humans do, do it, which is they, they, plot, they, they sense patterns in their environment. Right. So they, they built that experience that when you were getting the land, the wave pattern changed in some way, which probably was undescribable. Um, and so uh, many, many senses are not coupled with conscious processes or many aspects of senses. Well, there's a lot of things there. I love the autonomy question, but I want to go a little bit deeper with it. Um, so the, the idea, let's see, these autonomous robots um, have a certain stage, it seems, of what you described in your talk is the idea that somehow we send these things out there, and then we decide that something is really there, if a bunch of them agree, and if we finally agree, whoever the person is, we stand with their perception. So this is this notion of a community developing. And I really like the idea of robot collaboration. I think it's something that actually a lot of artists can do these days. And, uh, and so the thing that I was sort of interested in was that following up on this idea that somehow, I'm a little about the idea that somehow we want these robots to somehow find the interesting thing. And as we probably re recognize, if we put 10 people on them, they're going to probably find at least five or six different interesting things, which would depend upon a lot of issues, uh, certainly uh, how they grew up and what the kinds of experiences that they've had. And I'm just wondering, first of all, um, when, do you, are, when these people build these robots, is there a lot of, there a lot of artists involved in these things? Or, are there, are there people who think about think about um, collaboration or dialogue in that way? I mean, for example, you know, people who study, I don't know, improvisers or, or people of that sort. I mean, they study that sort of thing. Or do they do their own? My impression is that you should read Minsky and those kind of people. I mean, those people will take ideas anywhere they can find them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my impression is that there are artists and people thinking from that point of view involved in some of those robotic experiments. I just want to tell them that. You must know some of work in that way. Yeah, and, and, and I interact with people that force me to us. And when I go home to my lab, I sometimes have trouble with the questions I bring back with me from these guys' of meetings. Uh, uh, in reaction to what you just said, I just want, want to tell an anecdote um, and tell her, her an example. Um, it, it's a fact that human mythology um, has a very connect, close connection to um, mythology and cosmology to what we can see with the human eye. And if you go out to the night sky every night, you can see about 6,000 stars to the naked eye or something. And there are very few things that change. A planet or a comet, they're very rare. The things that change in the night sky are very rare. That's a total accident of your human eye. And so the, the mythologies and cosmologies that we've developed over centuries say that in the sky, the things that move or change are gods or portents or warnings. I mean, these are all very deep, deep, deeply great things. 
And that is, that's an accident of the sense of the human eye. If I happen to be an animal with X-ray or gamma ray eyes, every time I went out into the street and looked at the night sky, it would be different every night. It would, almost, uh, every hour, the night sky is dramatically changed. And so that animal would look up there, and everything is just changing and moving. And occasionally, you'd see something that was there all the time. And so your God would be the thing that didn't change. Right? And so indeed, what's interesting is it, almost a total accident of what your eye was tuned to. I mean, if the human eye is tuned to the part of the light where the night sky doesn't change every night, then the x-rays it does. And so the interesting thing there doesn't change. And in my universe, the interesting thing does change. And you know, that's kind of an extreme example of how closely coupled those concepts are tied to, to, to the way that we, that we see. Yeah, but why are they so different from well, both? I just had different ways of looking at that. I, you know, I could buy that if I believe that fundamentally we all have the same senses and it's simply an act of birth that we develop in this way or that way, but it seems to be things developed over uh, as part of a community of things that go beyond like transductive notions and sense. I'm a little uncomfortable no, yeah, with this kind of universalizing. No, 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 no and, I, and, I, and I, I'm not going to claim a reductionist standpoint. Like the, this, kind of sense, this kind of sense leads to that kind of mythology, and, that, and, that, and that's not the case. But um, it, it's certainly true that what you interpret as important in the environment around you depends on how you go about detecting things. And, and yeah, that's not universal, but it, it, it's part of just signal processing. It's, uh, and so uh, how that gets embedded into mythology is now a, a, a cultural process, an alert process, or an overload process. Um, I guess that's so, what I'm getting to is the extent to which this thing you're talking about is the expression of a particular culture. For example, the notion of migrants versus settlers. Where migrants eventually become settlers. In fact, uh, there are other names for migrants, and these people are conquerors, converters in some cases, but you won't have to worry about that on Mars. But the thing I'm trying to get to is I'm trying to understand what the extent to which this is, you know, if you're trying to understand these sorts of things about autonomy, you know, you have to consider that kind of that kind of experiential context when people develop different ideas and what possibly is interesting. You know, that's sort of on a higher level or different level of yeah. sensory transmitting level. Or the notion of sensitive transducers, and then you add certain sensors that more